Like every tree stands on its own Reaching for the sky, I stand alone Quest for Camelot In concept, this sounds like it could turn out to be a great movie. I mean, an animated fantasy film based on the King Arthur legend? The possibilities are endless and it leaves it open for animators and filmmakers to really go full loud with their creativity. In practice, however, it fell into all the wrong circumstances. I'm not saying anything about the movie itself just yet, but the production of this was an absolute nightmare. During the late 1990s, Warner Brothers thought that they could make animated films in order to capitalize on the success that Disney was having throughout that decade, but in reality, the heads at the time had no idea what they were doing. In fact, the big reason why Warner Brothers feature animation failed in the first place was because they thought they can be Disney, but they're not Disney. And their movie's production flow and box office performance were the ones paying the price. Leaving this, along with the Iron Giant and Osmosis Jones, to be failures. But, let's forget about its troubled past and give Camelot a second chance. We did that to the Iron Giant and now it's hailed as one of the best and most important animated films ever created. So now that we'll be eating ham and jam and spam a lot, will the film be equally as mighty as Excalibur itself? Or is Camelot as impressive as a model of the real thing? Let's find out. The story. Now this is what I'm talking about. If there's one thing this movie knows what to do, it's to make a fascinating medieval fantasy world. While it does contain a simple story of finding Excalibur in order to save Camelot, which yeah, it, it can be a little predictable, the main focus is not regarding the plot itself. It's the journey and the obstacles the characters have to face along the way, especially in the Forbidden Forest. From there, the movie would not only include many of the classic fantasy elements like living plants, dragons, griffins, ogres, and more, but would also spice things up with its own brand of unique creatures, like men who are made of weapons and some creative magic that you won't find anywhere else. I'll transform the beak and sickly into iron men with hands of steel. It is interesting to see how this movie develops its environment and how some of their characters can go around it. It's the kind of film that really does have a lot of great ideas. But while it does have some concepts with strong potential, all of that is unfortunately ruined by the execution. You see, the biggest issue with the film is that it doesn't want to be its own movie, like not even attempt to stand out from the crowd. Instead, it just wants to be like every other animated feature released back in the late 1990s whose only purpose is to cash in on what Disney masterfully capitalized at the time. This results in the film to have its tone be all over the place without really knowing what it's trying to do. Sometimes it wants to be intense and show how fierce and serious the villains can be, and suddenly switch to becoming an off-the-wall cartoon filled with a whole bunch of cartoony sound effects. Oh, uh, which reminds me, the movie tries hard to also be a comedy, but for the most part, the jokes feel like a bad attempt to be like the genie from Aladdin and end up incorporating a whole bunch of lowbrow humor and terrible pop culture references that devalue a lot of the script. The story has a lot of the right ideas, but it doesn't have the right direction to go with it. The Animation Despite all that I would say regarding this film, I will give it credit that it does have a talented team of animators behind it. Since this movie can offer some good ideas, it knows how to visually present them with the animation. You see, that's where most of its magic would be and what sucks people into this interpretation of King Arthur's England. As audiences enter upon his kingdom and into the Forbidden Forest, it presents this large scale that by going into the area, it would seem a lot bigger on the inside than at first glance, on top of giving the layouts a bit of a painterly-like feeling that pays close attention to some of its detail. Not to mention a good use of its color palette where it plays around with being bright and vibrant and dark and gritty. But while the places can look nice, 
It's the creatures that live there are what brings out that fantastical feeling. A lot of its creative points would go into the designs where they deliver their own version of classic mythical creatures like fearsome dragons, a giant rock ogre, a powerful looking griffin, and all the different living plants. Not to mention Ruber's weapon minions and all the different interpretations the artists can come up with that would have their own function. As for the character animation, they would move in many different ways but they don't differ too much from one another, so it would seem like they all belong in the same universe. The humans are more down to earth, the comic reliefs are more eccentric and rubbery, and everything else would go in between to suit the role they play. I'm Devon, and this growth on my neck is Cornwall. But you can call me Connie for <gasps> short. Yes, short on wit, manners, and charm. If there is one major issue that I would point out with the movie's visuals, it's within the animation where it is the most noticeable how it wants to be a Disney movie. Seriously, look at the aesthetics of how this was all built like some of the character designs and the layouts. It's the kind of film that almost wants to fool people thinking that it's made by Disney in order to sell their movie. That and its use of early CGI is pretty bad. It doesn't blend well with the 2D animation, and nowadays, it can make the movie feel a little dated. Guess all the good CGI people at the time were all too busy on the Iron Giant. Sure, it does try to be something else, but the animation is still strong for what it does. The Characters Here are three words to describe the cast of Quest for Camelot. What. A. Mess. Technically, this would count as a diverse cast, but the only diversity here is the issues that they have, from being poorly written to obnoxiously dull to ridiculously over the top. Starting with our main heroine, Kaylee is nothing but the generic dreamer who wants to ultimately save the day. Ever since she was a little girl, she always wanted to be a knight in King Arthur's court. But then after hearing Ruber's plans to take over Camelot, she was left with no choice but to go find Excalibur to stop his evil mission. Garrett, however, is the character that has the most potential. Living in the forest for most of his life, he is a blind hermit that knows the ways around the area and how to not fall into the dangerous traps, only accompanied by a falcon that somehow makes a boo noises. <laughs> Excalibur is here? Right. We're going after it. <laughs> and now, esteemed Defendi, we feast, all right. In a way, his character can be admirable, since disabled badass characters are a rare breed in animation, or even just in general. However, the one problem with this guy is that, for the most part, he's mostly treated as just Kaylee's love interest. Then there's Devon and Cornwall, the two-headed dragon that always bicker and argue at each other who help Kaylee and Garrett on their adventures. Basically, they're just the comic relief duo that would team up Don Rickles and Eric Idle, providing most of the jokes in this movie. Sure, they can get annoying at times and hold this obvious moral about working together, but at least they can have some funny moments and serve a purpose to the story. They're a lot more useful compared to freaking Bladebeak, who has no point other than to make cringy pop culture references. And then there's Ruber, the antagonist that wants to take over Camelot. Let me just say that Gary Oldman is an amazing actor. Throughout his career, he has delivered a lot of wonderful performances, including in animation like with Lord Shen in Kung Fu Panda 2. With that said, the fridge is he doing here? I get that River is supposed to be a madman, but his craziness is inconsistent throughout the movie, where he would often snap at random moments and strangely get quiet in other. Zyla! <sighs> See what I'm dealing with here? Regardless of the situation, the characters each have something that would give the movie a lot of problems. The songs. Okay, this is a very strange case when it comes to the musical aspect. The biggest issue here is not the songs themselves, but rather how the movie used them. Allow me to explain. On their own, most of them are great. 
The only one that was weak on the list is Ruber's song because it mostly consists of Gary Oldman blabbering nonsense like a lunatic. I have a plan. It includes you. You, Juliano, lead me to Camelot, where I will claim all that is mine. But as for the rest, they have an inspiring tone that would encompass the main characters, like On My Father's Wing with Kaylee or I Stand Alone with Garrett. Every tree stands on its own Reaching for the sky, I stand alone There are also those that are made to deliver hope and love, accompanied with a beautiful composition, like United We Stand, The Prayer, and Looking Through Your Eyes. I would even throw in if I didn't have you to be an entertaining musical number. Sure, it may feel out of place for this movie, but it is handled like a fun duet. Oh, what I could be if there was only me. Oh, what I'd do if I didn't have you. Oh, what I'd do if I didn't have you. However, as great as these songs can be, the movie has no idea how to incorporate them onto itself. Whenever a musical moment does happen, it feels like it just came right out of nowhere and would do it not because it wants to, but because it has to copy Disney's formula. Also, with the exception of If I Didn't Have You, it is almost laughable how noticeable the difference is between the original voice actors and the ones singing the songs. It ends up adding the awkwardness to the musical numbers and how they feel forced. But if that wasn't enough, Sometimes the characters would sing at the absolute worst moment. Like, let's talk about The Prayer. Beautiful song. Even got nominated for an Oscar. Oh, and uh, by the way, yes, Quest for Camelot is an Oscar-nominated feature. It's great that the movie would use this song. Not when it's used during a chase scene when Kaylee is running for her life from the Weapon Minions! The issue is not the songs. They're great. It's just how the movie handles them even makes the characters tired of musical numbers. Oh, I suppose so. But no more singing. Quest for Camelot is one of the best examples of how an amazing opportunity can be wasted. It's got all the materials to make a great animated feature like some strong concepts, a talented team of animators, and songs that stand very well on their own. However, due to its poor direction and a nightmare of a production, it ended up coming out as just a cheap Disney clone with a weak story, bad humor, and terribly handled characters. I mean, sure, some elements came out well and saves it from being a completely bad movie, but it doesn't change how it could have been so much more if it just tried to be its own thing. It's hard to say who I can recommend this to. If you're capable of looking past the Disney formula that it tries to emulate, and you're a fan of classic fantasy, then maybe at that point it would be worth watching, but don't expect anything grand out of all this. At the most, Watching this film is a lot like watching someone trying to pull the sword out of the stone that's not Arthur. as it was looking into Quest for Camelot, the one thing that actually interested me the most though in terms of looking into the story of Quest for Camelot and how it got made was actually looking into the history 
of Warner Brothers feature animation because that really was a tragic tale more so than what really happened to Quest for Camelot itself. Because the thing with Warner Brothers animation, it really was an animation studio that just really didn't know what it was doing. It didn't necessarily had a direction that it wants to go with its animated features. I mean, keep in mind, this is a studio that set its foundation because it really got lucky with one movie that was based on a commercial. And from there, the heads and the people that were running Warner Brothers Feature Animation, they just really didn't know what to do with their movies. They didn't know what to do with the marketing, they didn't know how to do a good production flow, and at the end of the day, it's the movies themselves that really did suffer, with really the exception of The Iron Giant and how that actually came out as a solid movie that critics and audiences absolutely adored, or at least the ones that actually saw it. But at the end of the day, because of the poor overall mismanagement of how things were running at the studio, it really was the movies that ended up being suffered. Like how Quest for Camelot was a failure, how uh, Iron Giant was a failure, and how Osmosis Jones was a failure. And they tried to give it life one more time with Back in Action, but that didn't really work out. So really for Warner Brothers, it was just one chapter in their animation history where they completely failed. Now, there is a bit of a silver lining in here where many years later, they did create Warner Animation Group, and that is actually working out for them a lot better than how it was with Warner Feature Animation. But then again, there actually is a bit of a silver lining as well with the movies from that era. I mean, of course, with the Iron Giant nowadays, it is considered a cinematic masterpiece. But even with the other ones that they created, like Quest for Camelot and even Osmosis Jones, they actually did went on to become a cult following since they do now fit into the nostalgia category. And on top of that, of course, you do have the Looney Tunes movies like Space Jam and Back in Action where they have their own cult following as well. Kind of like a little bit of a different category in their own terms and especially with Space Jam, how technically it's one of those movies that really did define the 90s, but at least with stuff like Quest for Camelot or Osmosis Jones, they did try to get a little bit of their own cult following nowadays where people do have some fond memories of watching them as a kid or if they did get lucky enough to actually see it in theaters and stuff like that. While The Iron Giant, well, nowadays, it really was in a league of its own. <laughs> Alright, so with all that said and done, now that I am finished with Quest for Camelot, it is now time that we go and move on to a Patreon request. Yes, and this time it will be from Thomas Richardson. So, uh, I just want to start things off by saying that if you guys would like to be like Thomas and you want to go and support my work and get some awesome rewards at the same time, including watching my videos before anyone else would, then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat. However, at the same time, if you guys would like to suggest an animated film you would like me to review and I would put onto the animation hat, then all you have to do is just write me an email at animatsreviews at gmail.com. So, the big question is right now, what is it that Thomas suggested me to go and review? Well, I just want to point things out that maybe for some of you who've been watching my videos for a while, Thomas is actually quite a familiar name because this is not his first time that he suggested me to go and review an animated film. His first one that he suggested to me was actually a sequel to a pretty popular movie from the 80s. But now, it is time that we go and check out the original. The ogre's butt. 